Well, good afternoon um, from Glasgow uh, to everybody that's possibly online. This is being live streamed and recorded, but we have a, a nice audience here today in person. So I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our session. I am Francis Bloom. I am the Senior Director for International Climate Policy at the Center for American Progress. And I'm gonna do just quick housekeeping for those online and here. Um, if you wanna follow us on social media, we're gonna use the hashtag Ocean Climate Action and the handle at Ocean Progress. So you can amplify our event and help us out. Um, and the plan is this, we are gonna have keynote remarks by Assistant Secretary Monica Medina. And then we're gonna have a panel of esteemed experts come up and talk about the importance of an issue uh, that is really at the intersection of, of climate and environmental justice. And we're going to explore why communities that are the most impacted by climate and the declining ocean health should be at the table. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to make just very brief remarks on ocean justice from my perspective as somebody that lives on the coast. I live in the city of Miami, a place that is a majority minority immigrant community with immigrants from Central America, South America, and Caribbean. Um, and it's a community that depends on the ocean um, for jobs and services. It's also a community that may have used the ocean as the way to escape political turmoil back home, as our city is a welcoming place for many communities um, that come that way here um, or to the United States. Um, our Biscayne Bay, which is a beautiful, um, and we have had, we have had uh, massive fish die-offs in the last few years, all tied to climate impacts. And so I speak uh, from the heart when I say that this topic matters to me because it matters to my community. The climate crisis is an ocean crisis. Uh, the ocean is our, our supply of food and oxygen. It powers our coastal economies, regulates our weather, and it provides cultural connection. The ocean also has the potential to provide about a of the reductions in greenhouse gases that we need to meet our target of 1.5 degrees limit in global warming. But for many years, as you all know, the ocean has been left out of the climate conversation, even though that started to change some at the last COP, what was dubbed the blue COP, COP25, um, it was started to be spoken about as a potential solution to climate change. Um, here at this COP, COP26, it's time to put those solutions to work to reach our climate goals. We need to start moving the conversation into actual projects on offshore wind and restoring blue carbon ecosystems like mangroves that store carbon and protect shorelines like the one where I live. But for climate solutions to be ambitious and durable, they must be inclusive. This means that communities of color who are often not consulted about the solutions they actually need, need to be at the table. Not just government representatives and the usual suspects who are the advocates, but those who are actually the most affected. And that's what today is going to be about. Now, I do have the pleasure of officially welcoming to the mic, Assistant Secretary Monica Medina, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs at the US Department of State. Um, she has a long career as a leader in oceans and conservation, over three decades of experience working issues from Arctic conservation to Gulf of Mexico restoration. In her current role, she leads participation in multilateral agreements and bilateral cooperation on environment, wildlife, and oceans. Welcome, Mrs. Secretary Medina, the floor is
Thank you so much, Francis, for that really nice introduction. And I'm so much more accustomed to being in the audience and part of the NGO, the large and wonderful NGO community. Um, but it's really a thrill to be here now in this job. And I wanna say, Francis, thank you for your introduction, actually. It really um, helps to, uh, I think, personalize how important the ocean is to all of us and um, how much we all get from it, how much spiritual renewal, how much, uh, how many resources and just how important it is to the health of our planet. Um, and this topic couldn't be more important. We have to bring oceans into the COP, but we also have to bring ocean justice into the COP discussions from now on. So I really am so grateful to the Center for American Progress for actually organizing this event and thinking about ocean issues from the lens of climate justice. So let me start by saying it's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the US government because we're back. We are here in force. We have 13 cabinet secretaries here over the course of the two weeks, three today. So I hope you'll go join them at the US government pavilion during various other parts of the day after this program. And we have dozens and dozens of people working on the text of the agreement to get ocean written into it and, and environmental justice written into it, um, rights of indigenous peoples recognized. We have people making lots of, of, you know, appearing in lots of events like this to talk about all the programs that we are rolling out these two weeks. And it's an impressive set of programs every day, more and more announcements, which is really exciting for those of us um, to be here. I, of course, am very passionate about oceans and particularly the intersection of the ocean crisis and the climate crisis. Um, we're here at, COP, um, I'm sorry, there are no ocean solutions without climate solutions and there are no climate solutions without ocean solutions. So yes, the crisis is intertwined, but so are the solutions that we will take. So setting the stage here for the US's engagement, um, we had several objectives. One was to show that we're here the second one was to actually try very hard to keep the one degree, 1.5 degree of global temperature rise within reach. Um, and to really pivot away from Glasgow at the end to making Glasgow the beginning of a decade of increased activity and engagement and investment in climate solutions. We know the science couldn't be clearer. Just yesterday, I was meeting with a, a group of respected ocean scientists who were making the point again how urgent it is that we take action now, that we turn commitments into real change in the water. Um, and this matters uh, because of the impacts that we're seeing all over the world and in our country. We know that the most vulnerable among us are the ones whose lives are most likely to be disrupted or even destroyed by severe weather, drought, fire, ocean acidification, loss of biodiversity, and sea level rise. For too long, environmental policy decisions have failed to account for environmental injustice. Pollution and climate change have disproportionate impacts on tribal nations, low-income communities, and people of color in the United States. We need to look at these inequities, see them in the face if we hope to overcome them. And we know that these are challenges firsthand because of what we see at home, not only um, in our own country, but then when we look abroad. President Biden has made clear that our administration will chart a new and a better and more equitable course, one that puts environmental and economic justice at the center of all we do domestically. As the climate warms, the losses impacting our homes are increasingly stark. We see ravages at the home at homes in the United States, from communities in the Mississippi Delta to Arctic indigenous peoples in our far north, and even basement apartments in New York City are not immune from the deadly consequences of severe storms. Climate change is squeezing these communities with new pressures. They're suffering from land loss as sea levels rise and flooding inundates their homes. More deeply, they're witnessing the loss of their culture, of their intergenerational traditions, and of their way of life. And I can speak to this personally from having visited some of these um, communities in Alaska and watched them talk about their ways of life and harvesting um, the resources of the ocean in traditional ways and saving them in, in um, permafrost freezers in the Arctic that are melting and making it impossible for them to store the food they need to last through the long winter. So I've seen it myself. 
And then there's Louisiana, another place that I've seen. I worked there after the devastating oil spill. And, you know, it's often said, but it's hard to imagine that in Louisiana, we lose on average a football field of land every hour to climate change over the last few decades. We also see it in our northern coastal communities where they're steadily losing a way of life that they've had for generations in fishing. And we see it in our Hawaiian island communities whose deep relationship with the sea is risked ever more by ever more frequent and inundated with storms. Even in Hawaii, which had always had these natural protections from storms, they're now seeing them more and more regularly. Our coastal communities, though, are not just victims of climate change. They're also the innovators at the forefront of change that we can all learn from. These are Americans who are striving to adapt to the impacts from climate by bringing new meaning to resilience to returning to traditional knowledge and teaching us and reinforcing both the built and the natural environment around them. We must prioritize this kind of ocean night mitigation from reducing shipping emissions to scaling up offshore wind to protecting coastal ecosystems as natural barriers to storms. As we galvanize the kind of global approach we need um, to accomplish our ambitious climate adaptation and mitigation goals, we need to center it around people who are most often overlooked. President Biden has called on our administration to follow the principles of equity in all our work at home and in foreign policy. So let me tell you about three ways very quickly that we are doing that. The first is called the Justice 40 Initiative. First, President Biden has launched a historic new plan called the Justice 40 Initiative that commits 40% of the benefits of climate and clean energy spending to disadvantaged communities. And if you're following our, our legislative uh, ups and downs back home, you know how much is involved in that um, promise. The goal to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 is critical to stem the harms that the most vulnerable will face. And this goal provides an unprecedented opportunity to create new jobs for those very communities across multiple sectors and help realize the administration's intersecting priorities on climate equity and economic justice. Second, let me tell you about something called the Local Islands 2030 Initiative, which will be announced later this week. So you're getting a little bit of a preview. Um, we're announcing this initiative that will empower um, resilience through all our islands and the ones um, that we work with overseas. So I urge you to stay tuned for that. It's an exciting way that the US can use partnership to expand the capacity of island communities using climate data, information and coastal management strategies to improve the resilience of these islands to ocean climate stressors. Last but not least, another one that's very near and dear to me, which is marine protected areas and an effort to um, continue to uh, create and, and protect our um, very precious marine resources by um, create by uh, through marine protected areas, which have many benefits for biodiversity, for communities, and also for combating climate change and helping the ocean to have places that are protected from the stresses of climate and other um, other things that impact like overfishing and uh, ocean acidification and pollution. These MPAs help to conserve biodiversity replenish valuable fish stocks, and safeguard the health of ocean ecosystems. The one that I think of the most when I think about this is Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in Hawaii. It was greatly expanded by President Obama, and it's just a perfect example of why we need this kind of ocean protection. Um, it was a community-led effort to expand that um, Marine National Monument, and it's one that I think will if a, a gift to future generations of Americans. We're also implementing this directive by uh, committing to conserving 30% of our waters by 2030, our ocean waters. And we're already really close, which is one of the good news stories um, of US environmental protection over the last few decades. We're well into the 20s, maybe in the high 20s, and I'm hopeful that we will get all the way to 30% during President Biden's term uh, first term. So it's very exciting. And we're committed to um, equitably and effectively managing these MPAs so that they recognize the indigenous peoples and local communities that are full partners and many, many of them. That's often one of the 
um, key points in creating a marine protected area is that cultural heritage. And I think there will be others that we'll be doing in the near future. So I think, um, let me just say in conclusion that we have come a long way. And I can say that in my decades, I've seen enormous progress, but we have a lot further to go and we can do it together, but we have to listen. We have to listen to communities, local communities all over the country um, who are facing the hardest impacts, but who are also leading the way. We can learn from all the, the work that they're doing. And I want to take that and help bring it to other countries, which is the exciting part of my job, knowing what I know about the innovation, the wonderful things that we're doing in the US. I'm sure that we can also help bring that knowledge to other countries and we can get knowledge from them and bring it back. And that's my job to be that point that pivots between the US and what we're doing at home and all the things that are happening abroad and what we can do to help our friends and neighbors in other countries. Um, so I pledge to take all that learning that I'm getting here and bring it back to the U.S., bring all the U.S. learning that we have, bring it to other countries. And I hope to work with all of you um, in doing that and very much look forward to uh, all that um, we have to do in the road from Glasgow, the new, the next 10 years, the new initiatives, all of this new work that we're bringing um, here, talking about here, can't wait to get it done. Can't wait to get it done. And we will need your help. We'll hope, hopefully we can count on your help. And I just want to thank again, my friends at the Center for American Progress for organizing this event. And uh, I want to, I'm especially excited to hear the other panelists um, talk about their work today. And I um, hope you have a great session. Thanks so much, Francis. I want to say hi to my mom at home who's watching. <laughs> hi, mom. I want to welcome the panelists and the moderator up. And while they do that, I want to just do a very quick introduction of the moderator for today. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ann Christensen. Uh, who is my teammate and my deputy at Center for American Progress. Uh, Anne is a scientist, a public policy expert, and an advocate. She has spent her career up to this point fighting to protect Antarctica, keeping plastics out of our oceans, and fighting for gender climate justice. And I'm very proud of her and I'm very proud of this event. And so, Anne, you have the floor. So oh, thank you, Francis. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thank you especially to Assistant Secretary Medina for her wonderful remarks. And we look very much forward to um, the amazing policies that will come out of the State Department over the next four years. So it is my honor to introduce our three panels today. And they have um, so many qualifications that I am gonna have to read directly from my notes so I don't get anything wrong. Uh, so first we have Anna Marie Laura. Uh, she is the Director of Climate Policy at the Ocean Conservancy, where she leads efforts to promote ocean-based climate change solutions. Prior to her role at Ocean Conservancy, she worked as an international conservation nonprofits and for climate and ocean leader, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, next we have Marce Gutierrez. Uh, Graudich, who is the founder and executive director of Azul, a grassroots organization focused on bringing Latino and Latin American perspectives to ocean conservation. She has led several conservation campaigns in California, including a shark fin ban and the first statewide ban of single use plastic bags in the United States. And last but not least, we have Senator Chris Lee, who represents District 25 in Hawaii State Senate. Of his many accomplishments, he led the effort to I expand national monuments in Hawaii, and as well as um, authored laws making Hawaii the first state in the United States to mandate 100% clean energy generation and to commit to carbon neutrality, both by 2045. So welcoming our three panels today. Um, I wanna get started 
with a quick question for all three of you. Um, how does what is action and ocean justice? So why don't we start with Senator Lee and then we can move down the line. Thanks. Um, you know, I think what's happening here is absolutely relevant for this moment that we're in. Like this is sort of that make or break. And while I don't think anybody expects the problem is gonna be solved by what happens here this week, it is, I think, indicative of a larger movement that is really from the grassroots up, right? We have world leaders here who are negotiating deals and all kinds of stuff to improve our future, but that's not all that's happening. What's really exciting about this particular cup is that for the first time, I think in a long time, we see subnational governments, um, state and local governments and countries around the world step up to implement changes that even national governments have yet to do. And it not only changes the scope of what we're capable of doing, irrespective of what our national governments do, but it helps embolden and empower them. And you know, in Hawaii, um, and the Assistant Secretary spoke to this briefly, you know, we, we struggle with, with plastics. We struggle with all the things that everyone's been working on. And you go down to the beach where we're at, you don't see it on postcards, but you put your hand in the sand, you come up with microplastics mixed in there like you would not believe. And we have cleanups where we see tens of thousands of pounds of plastic from uh, single-use disposable stuff that's washed up, uh, fishing nets and all the like, cleaned up on a single beach at a single time. It's a huge problem. And while I don't think we expect the United States or any other country to unilaterally fix that tomorrow, what we have seen is this grassroots effort of individuals, like kids and students and senior citizens get together and petition their local government to take action. And we've um, worked with our other counterparts around the country to be able to turn that into policy that has outright phased out and banned the use of those single use plastics that end up on those beaches. And that's something that we're hearing about now in our national discussion uh, in the United States and certainly here in the international stage. And if we have that pipeline coming out of the daily impact that people feel, translating into individual action, translating to local governments, turning into this national movement and international movement to deal with the problem, that's how these things get fixed. And for the first time, we're seeing that really start to play out right here. Wonderful. Thank you, Senator Lee. Marcy. Hi there. Um, well, the ocean doesn't have any borders, right? And so we see this work, this that transfer of work and activism in our daily lives because we work with immigrant and diaspora communities where we see people that talk about, for example, you know, they see that the climate change being front and center and they see it in sometimes their families, um, country of origins. And so obviously it's the collaboration, it's the movements, the momentum, uh, but also a really big reminder that these solutions have to be global, not just from that local aspect, because the ocean doesn't have any borders and we have to, we have to take action like we understand that. Wonderful, thank you. Anna Maria. Yeah, so building on that, I mean, I think we've seen and. Assistant Secretary mentioned this, that the ocean had sort of been siloed in UNFCCC processes for a long time. In COP21, we saw the ocean mentioned in the preamble, but you know that was it. We've come a long way um, from COP25, where there was, for the first time, an ocean climate dialogue that was mandated. And so we have the opportunity here at COP26 to see ocean climate action um, further integrated into UNFCCC processes. That ability to have additional dialogues, to have UN agencies, to have nations talking with each other, to each other about ocean climate solutions and how they work together internationally to promote those solutions in their national climate plans and their national decarbonization strategies can help promote the solutions that are coming from local communities that will benefit local um, coastal communities. So it, it is really important that we see the strengthened integration of ocean into the UNFCCC. So staying on that local level, Marce, you said uh, there are public opinion polls that have found communities of color in the United States that care deeply about the climate and ocean, but these communities are not getting a seat at the table and are left out of the discussions and many of the discussions here as well. So can you talk about how the organization that you are head of, Azul, has really demanded a seat at the table and, and your work on these issues? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so. You know, it's really interesting, and we are in a in an inflection point, I think, in the conservation movement. The fact that we're talking about ocean justice itself is a it's a big change. Um, if you talk 
talk to communities um, of color, they can tell you that that's their reality and ocean justice has always been. An, um, but for the longest time, the ocean movement, the conservation movement at large had a very siloed and it's starting to move and change now uh, view of who needed to be at the table and who needed to take action. And the fact is that, you know, growing up in, in Mexican American community and like people that I know, this is something's front and center. Climate Power just released a, a poll that talked about, you know, 75% of uh, Latinx communities thinking that this is a very important deal that uh, President Biden should do something about climate change now. And something like 80% saying that um, oil and gas companies should have to be held financially accountable for the for the harm that they enact. And so at the same time, I, you know, we were looking at Azul at what the movement looked like, who they were talking to, who they were working with and wondering what's the disconnect here. And so I will be honest, um, the way to get that seat at the table ended up being building a whole new one. And <laughs> what has happened 10 years later is that now the people in that table come over and say, hey, let's work together. Right, and so um, coming from California, where we are a majority um, um, majority people of color state, um, in our legislature and our leadership reflects that. That has been something that's been um, necessary because of things. Um, was for example, our thirty thirty um, executive order talks about environmental justice and from there went on to the federal executive order um but we have been we have been leading on that and i think it's important that um people realize that we need all hands our deck if you pardon the pun to take meaningful action um one of my favorite things about working in the ocean space are the ocean puns so i encourage all of you <laughs> to continue bring those up um senator lee uh talking about working together so all too often in the press and in some ideological narratives, we see that climate action and the um, idea of economic development are pitted against each other. I was wondering if you um, could talk about how you found a way to balance these priorities in Hawaii and to ensure that their benefits uh, reach the most vulnerable communities. Sure, you know, I think, and this is true, not just of Hawaii, but of communities, coastal communities around the world that are all facing similar challenges, sea level rise, storm surges from uh, disasters and weather events and all that kind of thing. And for a long time, the end owners along coastlines, um, there's been some reluctance to really get into climate and talk about what needs to change because it means impact, it means cost, it means things that they're going to have to bear. And these are players that often in many governments have a lot of influence. And I think for the first time, we're starting to see um, a discussion change because now it's not them versus the rest of us, right? It's how do we build out changes that need to happen to keep our communities safe, to ensure our way of life continues in a way that also reinvests in the community that can benefit everyone. And that's something that um, in Hawaii we, we're looking toward because we have immense uh, shorelines and some of our bread and butter economic engines like Waikiki, for example, um, you know, if we lose that beach, that's about a $2 billion annual loss to our, our local economy, which is, is devastating for everyone. And so instead of hitting each other against each other, what we found is businesses have been able to step up to the plate, hotels and others that share in that common good and make investments from their own pockets, coupled with our state and taxpayer investments to reinvest, to protect our beaches, to restore them. And like New York and some other big cities, look at how over the long term we invest money that not only just fixes our climate or, or adapts to the climate change we're seeing, but rather invests in those communities and builds out new spaces, new public parks, new amenities, new commercial areas, new whatever the communities want to see to be able to have something that's not just climate friendly, but also an added benefit for our infrastructure and for all of us. And that's something I think that people are starting to wrap their heads around where you have environmental groups and labor and investors and everybody from the community start to realize that this is our chance to really fix things and do what we need to do. Fantastic. Um, speaking of this is our chance to fix things, uh, the Congress has been, the Democrats in Congress have been working very hard to pass the Build Back Better Act um, and Biden's agenda there in terms of infrastructure and climate change. So Anne-Marie, I'm wondering if you 
can speak a little bit to the coastal resilience that we see in that agenda and how that will help vulnerable communities around the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a for President Biden's agenda of resilience. So the Build Back Better Act and the bipartisan infrastructure package really go hand in hand. If we're going to make social and build infrastructure investments, we have to plan for and mitigate the effects of climate change by addressing it. So they, they're, I mean, they need to be coordinated in that way. Um, but then also across those two bills, there are a number of ocean climate solutions that will benefit from investment. So coastal restoration activities and resilience, um, the transition away from fossil fuels, a just transition to a clean energy economy, uh, decarbonizing ports and shipping sector. Um, you know, and these are just some of them. Also additional tax incentives to promote offshore wind and other offshore renewable energy. These are some of the ocean climate solutions. They, it's happening against the backdrop, which was mentioned of Justice 40. So President Biden in his first week, um, issued an executive order to tackle the climate executive order on racial equity. And Justice 40 is a resulting initiative that has, there are other pieces of Justice 40 that are really important, like the fact that all the federal agencies have to have a community engagement plan, right? It's not enough just to make the money available. You have to go talk to communities um, and find out what the challenges are. Why weren't they able to access this money in the past? Why is it important to make it available and what changes do we need to see? And I, I think a lot of that you know, should have been or might have been happening, but now it's very intentionally happening and it's a mandate within the federal agencies. So the backdrop against, you know, the these investments that Congress has the ability to make is just a, an amazing opportunity. Um, when we talk about, you know, ports and decarbonizing shipping, for example, ports are very heavily industrialized areas. They often have communities that live near them that are historically marginalized and vulnerable because of, you know, um, discrimination, sometimes obvious, sometimes systemic. Um, and so if we can decarbonize our ports and prevent not just carbon emissions, but the other emissions from the shipping sector that are really hazardous to public health, you can improve the public health of communities that live nearby. Um, and so we need to be making the decisions when we're making funds available so that the benefits to the climate change mitigation efforts are realized, but also that the benefits are being realized um, at the community level. And we have to make sure that communities can access the money. Uh, oftentimes we see some criteria around these programs or investments from the federal government that include things like matching requirements. Um, it's a really common practice to say, well, if you wanna apply for federal money, we want you to prove that you're really gonna use it well, that you really need it. So you have to have a match. Well, a lot of communities can't afford to make the match. So we need to think very carefully about limits on match or eliminating matching requirements altogether. Um, and then the technical capacity, the community preparedness to climate change, community preparedness to access federal resources is not the same. It's uneven across communities. Um, and so we have to think about that and make sure that if we're investing in renewable energy deployment, we also invest in renewable energy job retraining and workforce training programs um, for vulnerable, marginalized, disadvantaged communities. Um, yeah, and so I think there's a huge opportunity. There's a lot of uh, questions to be answered about Justice 40. It's a great program. Ba very basic questions, like how do we define disadvantage? Uh, I know the administration is working through those things. They're considering a large range of socioeconomic factors, challenges, and it's a really important effort um, that I know that they're thinking through carefully. Thank you. I want to make sure that um, both of our other panelists have a chance to comment on the Build Back Better Act and what's going on in Congress if they would like. Yeah, it needs to get done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so pivoting a little bit away from that, I know all of you have um, really worked on removing plastics from the ocean, and I want to it's kind of a odd topic one might think to talk about at a climate change conference. So I'm wondering if each of you can talk to your work about ocean plastic and how that is relevant to the climate change conversation and is relevant to what we are doing here in Glasgow this week. We'll start with Senator Lee. Oh, sure. Um, you know, I think building on what I mentioned before, the story of how we were dealing with plastics in Hawaii, both its impacts as well as 
trying to get people engaged and actually do something about it. Uh, it's been kind of an exciting couple of years because this was an issue that wasn't on a lot of people's radar. I don't think there's a, a general connection between plastics and climate change and what it means for everybody else in the general public out there until maybe just recently because a huge portion of our emissions obviously comes from fossil fuels, which are a huge um, component of plastics. And now that we're thankfully able to say we're starting to phase out um, oil and gas and other uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation and from electricity, plastics is another huge sector that contributes to that. And so being able to deal with that in a meaningful way is huge. And you know, like I mentioned before, we have this opportunity where you have our youth, especially, who have this right on their minds. They're the ones that are feeling this firsthand. We have farmers who are finding plastics showing up in the, the soil and the compost that they're using that's ending up in our food supply. We're seeing it in our streams. It's washing down to our reefs and our beaches. And that's something that you know, we know that governments are already paying for. We spend millions of dollars every year cleaning up this stuff out of our storm drains, out of our streets and certainly on our, our public parks and beaches and other spaces. And that's something that people don't realize when they think about the cost, you know, what's it gonna cost to deal with the problem? Truth is we're already paying for it. And we're paying just the bare minimum because the impact that we're gonna feel to our economies, especially for coastal areas where you're impacting tourism and fishing and all the other things, that's gonna be a huge multiplier that's gonna both make the cost escalate exponentially in the years and decades to come if we do nothing but also provides the opportunity because we have to realize that we actually can do something about this. It's not gonna, the answer is not gonna be just cleaning it up indefinitely. We have to choke off the supply that's contributing to that in a negative way and reinvest in the way that we, we think of how the circular plastic economy goes. And that means changing the way that we're spending our money. Instead of just spending it to clean up, how do we spend that money as governments in the, the national and subnational areas to really, change the way that those things are dealt with can we invest in better ways to reuse recycle reduce most of all uh, and swap out plastics for other better options and that's something that you know we're really working on i think in partnership with folks around the world and it is uh, come back to this because it's so important we have not been successful at least where we're from because we suddenly had as revelation we we were successful because we had kids and local folks stand up and say, we're tired of cleaning this up. You know, we're contributing tens of thousands of man hours just in our neighborhood alone, cleaning up this stuff off our beaches. What can we do? And they were the ones that petitioned their local governments to make a change and phase out single use plastics and change the way that we're dealing with that. And that's something that um, a few of us were actually testifying before US Congress a couple of months ago on because that's now being incorporated into federal legislation. And yet here we are, couple months after that, talking to an international audience about these things. And all of this came out of the efforts of local folks in their own community. And that is just so exciting. I think that's very powerful um, to bring it down to the local level and realize that that is where the change happens, is we need to start it there and, and make sure that um, at places like the COP, that people can hear the voices of those who are taking action on the ground. Thank you. Marce. Um, You know, I grew up in a place where you couldn't drink water right out of the tap. And so uh, growing up, I had a very different relationship with plastic. And so that, you know, plastic bottled water was a necessity, um, quote unquote. And it's really interesting to approach it from that level because as we have grown and that's what has been around for 10 years, plastic pollution is actually the, um, I would say the entry point for a lot of people in my community in terms of taking, take, taking up activism. And, and it's not, and it's, that's not a contradiction between the bottled water and this. Um, I think it really illustrates where the problems are. So um, a couple of things, you know, you, you keep on thinking the bottled water is a necessity. And so, well, how are you gonna do this here? You can do it in the US, you can do it in both countries. But um, we, we recently published a report with the UN that talks about plastic pollution as an issue of environmental justice. And what we found is that plastic pollution was actually a, um, a, a problem in terms of achieving fully the sustainable development goals in a timely manner. Everything from, um, from gender parity to health to obviously the, the, the goal of 14 as well. But um, you know, as we were doing this research, um, what we found is that 
you know, there's all these studies that talk about how actually plastic bottled water is, um, it's more of a, a crutch than, than, than a solution. And so what these folks have found in Mexico and Latin America is that really give up on their, on their um, obligation to provide water, right? And so that has been more of a, more of a problem than actually a solution. Um, and what I can tell you is that, again, we see this every day in our work. And when we were trying to do uh, the, the plastic bag ban in California, which is sort of like what took off, um, people were going around saying, and I quote, people don't believe this, but this happened. Um, no, Latinos don't know how to use reusable bags. And I had to go and get one from my grandmother that said, well, this is the one my grandmother's used for you know, generations. So not only do we know how to do it, we can teach you. And there's a lot of disconnect and there was a lot of problems. And this is why the ocean movement really needs to get with the times because there was a lot of disconnect in terms of like, who are you talking to? Why are you trying to get to move this legislation? And this idea that somehow people of color weren't with it or understanding. And we did a poll shortly thereafter that actually showed us that in California it was communities of color, specifically Latino and black communities that were significantly more concerned about plastic pollution than white communities. And so this is part of that disconnect when you start to talking and not just talking, but also handing over the reins sometimes or you know, sharing the mic and sharing the power because um, we wouldn't have gotten that done in California and in other places if it wasn't for folks that were coming from those communities that are impacted, that know the cultural background, that understand those implications and that made it possible. And in the end, in California, the folks that passed that plastic bag ban were actually three um, Latino elected officials from LA. And recently we passed another one that actually talks about where we're exporting plastic because you know we can't also then go in grandstand and say, well, we don't do this here. And at the same time, we're shipping off our plastic waste to other countries, right? So to that effect, um, to bring it back to the global part, that's the effort between behind trying to have a, uh, a plastics treaty, like a globally uh, legally binding treaty that is hopefully going to happen in the next couple of, in the next year or so. Um, so we're we're very excited about that. But it definitely comes from the local the local perspective all the way up. Well, that's a very inspiring story of how you were able to get that done in California, but also a reality check for the narrative that I think we continue to hear in the environmental community um, that has its own equity and justice issues internally. Uh, so thank you for sharing that and, and hopefully we can all support the work that Azul continues to do in California. Uh, Anna Marie. Yeah, um, so Ocean Conservancy has been working on reducing plastic pollution through a number of ways for a long time through cleanups and um, you know, there is this such a, there's a connection between climate and plastics and that plastics are 99% fossil fuels. And so as we talk about transitioning away from fossil fuels, we cannot not talk about transitioning away from plastics, um, but we often don't. So you see risk disclosure for carbon emissions that doesn't necessarily follow to the plastic supply chain. And we should think about doing that. Um, the, you know, as we make the transition away from fossil fuels, there's a need to think about how do in, we're incentivizing renewable energy. How do we incentivize the types of alternatives to plastic that we know there's a uh, you know, a lot of the communities are waiting for these alternatives so that they can use them. Um, and we can do that. We're incentivizing energy. We can incentivize alternatives, but you have to put that into the policies. You have to transition, remove the subsidies for fossil fuels, create the better incentives for other processes. Um, and just going back to another justice issue around plastic production, petrochemical facilities that are the processors of the fossil fuels, but also that create the plastics are often also co-located with a lot of vulnerable and marginalized communities. And so when we transition away from plastic or we look towards improving our recycled content standards, we would also be benefiting communities by removing another public health risk to them. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a very important connection to make that we don't make enough in the climate space. Um, and we can do that. We can do that more. Thank you. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions from the audience, but ending um, with a final question for the panelists of what gives you hope 
looking towards the future um, in terms of climate and ocean justice? Or what are you working on that you're looking forward to getting back to after returning from Glasgow? So starting with Senator Lee again. You know, I um, was fortunate to grow up in Hawaii and we grew up swimming in the ocean. And uh, I remember I was kind of a, still am a total nerd. So we grew up in high school um, mapping out the bay where I, in the community where I live. My friends and I would swim out and we'd check out where all the, the coral is and what's swimming where and with tanks, we catch fish, put them in and went back after returning home from college. And it wasn't a span of more than maybe 10 years uh, between. And a lot of it was just dead. And you know, a lot of that's due to um, increased runoff and um, warming and acidification, all kinds of things. But fast forward now, after COVID, we went back again. And for the first time we're seeing turtles again, and I was swimming at um, this preserve that had been closed. It had, it was the most popular tour spot in Hawaii. It was just like, it's called Hanama Bay. And was basically overrun, trampled. And the reef was for the most part dying off. And we went back after it had been closed for about um, 18 months or so. And for the first time we had endangered Hawaiian monk seals swimming around with us. And we had turtles and the fish were just amazing. And, and these kinds of things can bounce back. And I think if we take that action as quickly as we can, we have that opportunity. That window is not yet closed and we can deal with some of this stuff and protect what we can. We're not gonna be able to do it all, I think, as quickly as we need, but we can triage and really make investments in the right places and let it bounce back. Because ultimately, I mean, our way of life on land depends on the ocean. And if we lose that, then we lose everything. I think that's a very powerful message for all of us and that we can bounce back from the last couple of years as well to something healthier uh, and more resilient in the future. Marce? Um, specifically, very active in promoting 3030, both at the California and at the federal level, um, 30, protecting 30% 30 of the ocean by 2030 in our case. Um, also working on plastics issues, this global treaty. Um, but very excited and hopeful to see this change of um, communities of color and indigenous leadership and just getting new leadership at the forefront of conservation because yes, the environmental movement has done so much and has been very accomplished, but at the same time, it's not quite enough. And so I'm very excited to see this shift change um, and it's, it does give me hope to see the narrative change and to see things like um, ocean justice and environmental justice permeate all kinds of conversations that we wouldn't even, you know, people laugh in my face and left in other people's faces probably that have been doing this longer. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see this change and that's what gives me hope. Fantastic. Anna Marie. Yeah, I mean, being here gives me hope. Uh, we've I've only met Marseille in a little Zoom screen before today, so, but we have met in Zoom. And so I think being here um, at COP, there are probably more people because they've allowed for so much virtual participation, able to participate in this COP than any other COP. And that's amazing. And it feels very energizing to know that there's that virtual engagement and also to be here in person. Um, so I'm excited about that for ocean climate justice issues because we have a lot of new tools to bring voices to the table even in an international you know negotiation type meeting and i know that we can do that for local processes for national processes for state processes um, and so having those tools and knowing that the call for having a diversity of voices at the table is only growing and we know how to do that in a better way is really exciting fantastic yes i'm it has been um, an interesting experience being back in person here and to meet so many wonderful people again, um, but very excited that we are able to engage with an online audience as well to bring them into the room. So that's fantastic. Um, now I want to let the people in this room have a chance to ask our panelists uh, any questions they might have that the conversation has brought up. And perhaps one of my colleagues is monitoring online in case there's any questions there. Yes, in the back. Hi, so first of all, thank you. Thank you, everyone, the speakers, the presenter, the organizers. Uh, this was terrific. Uh, there are not a lot of ocean-related um, events, unfortunately. 
So I really appreciate it. So I am Alicia Perez Porro. I am the deputy director of a research center in Spain. We focus on ecology of climate change and biodiversity. And I have kind of like a, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated question, but like, um, so we've been following negotiations for years and ocean has been kind of like sneaking its way, right? To that zone over there. And it's been, like you were mentioning, it's a push from like the NGOs, the youth, the civil society, but there is still a disconnection. And how long do you think it's going to take until we see ocean as an item of the agenda of the negotiations? Or even if you think that that's useful or is better to just to keep pushing in this sneaky way to put ocean in absolutely every item of the agenda. Thank you. All of the meta. Okay. Um, so it's a great question. I think it is sneaking its way in there, but also it's very intentionally being championed by a number of parties, which is an amazing thing. A lot of the small and developing states, including Fiji and Indonesia, well, Indonesia is um, a larger developing state, uh, but there are a number of parties who are championing this now. And it's that number is only growing and it's wonderful to see, including the US now that they're back. Um, but there are, it's really important that parties, all of us recognize the existing opportunities for ocean in all of the existing agenda items and processes. When you're, whether it's talking about the finance committee or the technological working groups, or those are places that ocean solutions can also be, they can already be brought up. Um, they're just not as integrated. It's not as much of a focus. And that's, you know, the long sort of standing silo of ocean and climate issues that we are starting to see really be broken down. So I think it's a yes and it, you do need to continue the push from civil society and outside and calling for it in any way possible. Um, but then also it is really nice to know that parties are championing this as we speak and growing. I do think UNFCCC is a place for incremental process. So building on the dialogue that happened at the end of last year, thinking about the process and the kind of text and outcomes we want and then using that as a stepping stone in the future. But I, I do really think that it's only going to continue to become more integral. Thank you. Anyone else? I would just say, yeah. And we, we do see it outside of this, just in the conversation with like the high emission um, coalition. So I, I, I'm hopeful, but it's definitely going to be uh, both the, I don't know if I call it sneaking as much as, much as like trying to burrow a place in. Uh, <laughs> and, and the push and obviously, you know, supporting, supporting the parties that are, are making that big push. Yeah, I think I just add, you know, I think there's, there's, there's two interesting things here from a political perspective. One is all communities or nations um, within their exclusive areas. But then there's this whole international presence, right? Where you have the, the ocean, which is which belongs to everybody. And dealing with those does require that international cooperation, which is why we're all here. And I think it's so important that that conversation continues. I think regardless of where that goes, in the areas where you have communities themselves that can get involved and do their part in their own jurisdiction, that stuff's gonna happen regardless of what national governments do because everybody sees the value in that, and of investing in that and dealing with those issues. But we just hope that translates into spurring those national governments to take action because the local folks have proven that this is good for us, right? It helps our communities, it helps our economies, it helps everything. And so why not do it internationally in a way that cooperates between nations and helps us globally? I think that's ultimately gonna be what we see. Fantastic, thank you for your question. I think we have time for one more, if there's one more in the room, yes. First, thank you for all for sharing your thoughts. I especially appreciated the personal um, stories that you all shared with um, your relation to this important topic of ocean justice. Um, some of the ideas um, I think were already touched on that I'm referring to, but I did want to ask a follow up question. Um, input and leadership of the most affected communities should be central to the implementation of programs like Justice 40 standards and other federal state ocean climate efforts, especially in the policy realm. 
So in your opinions, what specifically do you think needs to change um, in the US political sphere in order to maximize these opportunities for disadvantaged communities in a way that's both equitable and meaningful? Excellent question. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. I think um, in the US sphere, everything needs to change. <laughs> but barring that, you know, I think there are a couple of good examples. And, you know, in Hawaii, I think um, they've been mentioned, we expanded the Papahanaumoku Akea Marine National Monument, which at the time of its expansion became the largest protected area on the surface of the planet. And I think you mentioned that I led that. I didn't lead that. I, I helped wow. lead some of the organizing um, at the local level, but it was in support of our, our U.S. Senate delegation and the Obama administration at the time, which really were at the federal level moving the needle. But what we came up against was this intransigence and in opposition and, and fear that, you know, it's going to affect the fishing industry and all these other things. And there was a, a big void in that conversation early on. And that was our native Hawaiian community that wasn't represented at the table in the way that they, they could have been. And I think over time, as the campaign moved forward, we realized, you know, these folks have absolutely the same right to be a part of this conversation because for generations, long before any of us have been around, um, their families and their ancestors have been using these resources sustainably. And so how can we make any sort of policy without considering that input? And what came out of it was this um, agreement to expand this area and protect in perpetuity what could be on the chopping block because of climate and international fishing pressure was seats at the table for our Native Hawaiian community for those voices to make sure that not only do they have access um, to, to pursue their traditional and cultural um, practices in the area, but to make sure that they're there forever forward. And I think this kind of revelation had, had it been in any of these big battles that are being fought from the start to engage communities that are often disadvantaged or cut out of the process, despite being central to them, makes everything easier. And I think really empowers those folks who are trying to fight for good for all of us. Um, I would draw a comparison between what needs to change in the US and what needs to change globally, which is that the folks that are in power, whether it's a you know, dominant culture in the US um, or you know more richer countries here need to really um, step to the side and make more space for folks that are more impacted. And, and, and not in a paternalistic or condescending way where we're sort of like inviting or giving voice. No, this is like handover. This is how much you've done. And maybe a little bit, um, a little bit, um, I don't know, crazy on my part, but I think that's when we've seen that is when things really start to change. So both in the US and at this level, we need to get the folks that have been empowered to start sharing or stepping a little bit to the sides of folks that need to do the work. And, and yeah. That's not crazy. That just makes a lot of sense. Um, and just from a federal policy perspective, international policy, we can change the system. I mean, when you write policy, there are a lot of things. If you want to change systemic racism and marginalization, we should change the system and we should mandate consultate, not just consultations, we should mandate involvement, we should mandate the processes that we want to see that we know will result in inclusion, because we do have examples of the types of processes that have community based outcomes, community led outcomes, um, and we should put them into the, the rules from the start. And I know you weren't asking me, but I want to build off of that as well, of removing some of those laws and policies that were put in place specifically to marginalized communities. And we have seen some of that happen in the last few months and we've been talking about it, removing the policy of, of matching community yes. grants. So some of these things that we have identified that have institutionalized discrimination, removing that, and then obviously bringing more people to the table and moving aside and letting them take over the table, I think is incredibly important. So I think we are at time. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you everyone who was online. Um, there will be a recording available at AmericanProgress.org slash events, so you can find out more information about this work, our panelists, and um, future events from CAP. But if we can give a huge round of applause to our panelists today. And thank you to the Bologna Foundation for hosting us.